Welcome to the basic obstetric ultrasound training course for healthcare providers. Ultrasound plays an important role in identifying pregnancy-related conditions that put the mother or fetus at risk during delivery. In most low-income countries, there is a shortage of people experienced in performing pregnancy ultrasound. This course was created to train healthcare workers to perform basic pregnancy ultrasound in parts of the world where formal training is not available. The videos, as well as other educational materials, available at tinyurl.com backslash uwultrasound, are designed to be used in a two-week ultrasound course. The hands-on sessions in the trainer's guide are an essential component of this course and must be supervised by an experienced ultrasound practitioner. This is not a comprehensive pregnancy ultrasound course and does not result in an official certification or diploma. After you finish the course and pass the written and practical tests, we strongly recommend you have at least 40 hours of scanning experience with clinical mentoring before you undertake unsupervised scanning. My name is Dr. Christina Adams Waldorf, and I will be narrating this 10th video in our Pregnancy Ultrasound series. This video will focus on the amniotic fluid. Please visit our website for access to all of our video and training materials. There are two main skills you will learn in this lesson. You will learn how to measure the volume of amniotic fluid and provide appropriate care if the amniotic fluid levels are too low or too high. The key terms that you will learn in this lesson are oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios. Oligohydramnios means that there is a decreased volume of amniotic fluid. Polyhydramnios means that there is an increased volume of amniotic fluid. Please pause the video to practice saying oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios with your trainer. The fluid that surrounds the fetus is called amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is mostly water and is contained in the amniotic sac. It helps the fetus in many ways. The amniotic fluid cushions the fetus, allows room for the fetus to grow, helps prevent infection, helps keep the temperature constant, and helps the fetal lungs develop normally. What will amniotic fluid look like on ultrasound, and why? Please pause the video now to encourage responses from the group. Because it is fluid, it will appear black on ultrasound because it is anechoic. Amniotic fluid is produced in different ways. Early in pregnancy, Amniotic fluid is produced by the placenta and surrounding membranes. Later in pregnancy, most of it comes from the fetal kidneys and lungs. Because the amniotic fluid performs so many functions, it is very important to have the proper amount. Sometimes it can be either too high or too low, which can cause problems in the pregnancy. There are two ways to measure amniotic fluid with ultrasound which we will now discuss, called the maximum vertical pocket and the amniotic fluid index. We use the maximum vertical pocket method, or MVP, with singleton pregnancies less than 24 weeks gestational age or when twins are present. To find the MVP, locate the largest pocket and measure its vertical height. If there are twins, we measure the largest pocket for each twin. Measure the deepest fluid pocket free of umbilical cord and fetal parts. Note that cord or fetal parts may be seen in the image, but should not be in the vertical path of the calipers. A normal MVP measurement is between 3 and 8 centimeters. Look through the entire amniotic sac to find the deepest pocket. Measure the depth. Notice that the calipers form a vertical line, meaning straight up and down, that does not cross the umbilical cord or fetal parts. In pregnancies older than 24 weeks gestational age, we calculate the amniotic fluid index, or AFI. With this method, we measure the depth of four pockets and add them together for an AFI score. 
These pockets are measured in the same way as the MVP, and the vertical line cannot cross the cord or fetal parts. The normal AFI range is between 5 and 24 centimeters. There are four basic steps to find the AFI score. First, divide the uterus into four quadrants. In each quadrant, find the area or pocket that does not contain umbilical cord or fetal parts. Next, measure the vertical height of the deepest pocket in each quadrant. Add measurements from all four quadrants to get the AFI score in centimeters. The first step in measuring the AFI is to visually divide the uterus into four quadrants in your mind. Next, identify the deepest pocket of fluid in each quadrant that does not contain cord or fetal parts. This should be a solid black area on ultrasound. Notice that if we connect the calipers with a line, the line is straight up and down or vertical. This is a cross-section of the abdomen. There is just a small pocket of fluid in this image. We have labeled this pocket with red calipers to make it more obvious. Step three is to measure the vertical height of each pocket. Please note the calipers in this image and the vertical direction, meaning straight up and down, of the measurements. Finally, add all four measurements together to determine the amniotic fluid index. Is this AFI normal? Please pause the video now to encourage responses. The answer is that a normal AFI falls between 5 to 24 centimeters. The AFI in this patient is normal. Here are several examples of incorrect caliper placements to measure the size of the amniotic fluid pockets. Please pause the video now to ask participants why these caliper placements are incorrect. There are several reasons why they are incorrect. In the upper left and lower right images, the calipers are not straight up and down from each other. In the lower left image, there is umbilical cord in the vertical path connecting the two calipers. Remember that neither umbilical cord nor fetal parts can be in the path of the calipers. In the upper right image, the top caliper was placed too low, which means that the measurement for this pocket is smaller than it should be. Let's study this image more closely to determine why this caliper might have been placed too low. We have now enlarged the image. Look just anterior to the top caliper and you will see a hazy or fuzzy cloud that blurs the true edge of the uterus. Here we have outlined this cloud, which is an artifact and is not really there. This is called a near-field artifact and can be seen sometimes in the near fields of the image because the ultrasound echoes bounce and scatter in the body wall of the patient. This type of artifact occurs more often in heavier patients. Sometimes turning down the near field gain will reduce this artifact. The top caliper may have been placed too low in this image because the sonographer confused this near field artifact with the uterine wall because their echogenicity is similar. Here we show the correct location for the top caliper, which was placed by estimating the greatest height of the amniotic fluid pocket from the uterine wall that can be seen just to the right of the top caliper. Here are examples of correct caliper placements measuring the vertical heights of amniotic fluid pockets. Please take time to look at these images now by pausing the video. In the lower left image, notice that there is a loop of cord, but that the measurement is taken next to it, and the vertical line between the calipers does not cross the cord. When the AFI is too low, it causes a condition called oligohydramnios, which presents a high risk for fetal complications or death. There can be several causes of a low amniotic fluid volume, such as leaking membranes, a pregnancy that has gone beyond the due date, various fetal urinary tract abnormalities, and intrauterine growth restriction. We will discuss growth restriction in another lecture. If the membranes are leaking and the leaking has stopped, 
the membranes may reseal and the amniotic fluid levels could return to normal. Patients with leaking membranes are at increased risk for infection. With oligohydramnios, you will see little or no amniotic fluid on ultrasound. The fetus will appear crowded. Because of the lack of fluid, the fetal parts are more difficult to see clearly. This will be easier to understand after more hands-on scanning. There are two ways to measure oligohydramnios. Use only one of these methods and not both. Before 24 weeks of gestation, measure the maximum vertical pocket. You should also use this method if there are twins. At 24 weeks and later, measure the amniotic fluid index. An MVP, less than 3 centimeters, or an AFI, less than 5 centimeters, indicates oligohydramnios. Here are more examples of oligohydramnios. Notice how these fetuses are harder to see here because there is no surrounding fluid. When there is too much amniotic fluid, an opposite condition results called polyhydramnios. Too much amniotic fluid may result in preterm labor or indicate an abnormal fetus. Polyhydramnios can also be caused by diabetes in the mother or a fetal condition like an obstruction of the esophagus or intestines. It is also possible that no cause is found, which is called idiopathic. With polyhydramnios, you will easily see the excess fluid on ultrasound. The fetus will appear to float with a lot of space between the fetus, uterine wall, or placenta. This is a sagittal view of a fetus with polyhydramnios. Notice the large amount of amniotic fluid between the fetus and the anterior wall of the uterus. There are two ways to measure polyhydramnios. Use only one of these methods and not both. Before 24 weeks gestation, measure the maximum vertical pocket. You should also use this method if there are twins. At 24 weeks and later, measure the amniotic fluid index. An MVP greater than 8 centimeters or an AFI greater than 24 centimeters indicates polyhydramnios. This is a transverse view of the fetal abdomen with excess amniotic fluid. Where do you see the excess fluid? Please pause the video now to encourage responses from within the group. This is a transverse view of the abdomen with excess fluid. Here you can see the umbilical cord inserting into the fetal abdomen. Notice again the excess fluid in this image and how the fetus appears to be floating. Let's give an example of how to use the information that you obtain from ultrasound. A patient comes to your health center for a screening ultrasound at 20 weeks. If it is normal, she should return to your health center for a screening ultrasound at 32 to 36 weeks. However, if you diagnose oligohydramnios, she should return for an ultrasound at 26 to 28 weeks. If the oligohydramnios persists, she should be referred to the hospital within days, not weeks. Even if the cause is premature rupture of membranes, oligohydramnios puts the fetus at risk for infection, poor lung development, and even death. Algorithms may vary somewhat according to local practice. You should consult your referral hospital for the algorithms appropriate for your practice. Note that in our algorithm, RH stands for Referral Hospital. If a patient comes to your health center at 20 weeks and she is diagnosed with polyhydramnios, ask her to come back for another ultrasound in two weeks. Often, polyhydramnios will resolve. If the polyhydramnios is worse in two weeks, refer the patient to the hospital for evaluation. If a patient comes to your health center after 26 weeks for the first screening ultrasound and it is normal, you should encourage her to deliver at your health center. After 26 weeks, all patients with either oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios should be sent to the referral hospital. Oligohydramnios is an urgent referral. Now let's review the key points from this lecture. What do you think of when you see the words oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios? 
When should you refer to the hospital immediately? Please pause the video now to give participants time to respond. Oligohydramnios means having low fluid and may be caused by leaking membranes. In oligohydramnios, the amniotic fluid index is less than 5, and this should trigger immediate referral after 26 weeks. Polyhydramnios means having too much fluid. This can be caused by maternal diabetes or fetal conditions. The maximum vertical pocket is 8 centimeters or greater for polyhydramnios, and the patient should also be referred to the hospital after 26 weeks. Now let's review definitions for oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios depending on whether you measured the MVP or AFI. The maximal vertical pocket method should be used in twins and singleton pregnancies less than 24 weeks. Oligohydramnios is diagnosed with an MVP less than 3, and polyhydramnios is diagnosed with an MVP greater than 8. The amniotic fluid index should be used in singleton pregnancies with a gestational age greater than 24 weeks. Oligohydramnios is diagnosed with an AFI less than 5, and polyhydramnios is diagnosed if greater than 24 centimeters. Here are more key points. The amniotic fluid has important functions in protecting the fetus. An abnormal amount of fluid can signal an abnormal pregnancy. Oligo and polyhydramnios can be determined by ultrasound, and proper follow-up is essential for fetal health. If the fluid appears low, perform an AFI. Questions for review. Please pause the video now to discuss these questions and answers among the group. What do the terms oligo and polyhydramnios mean? The answer is that oligohydramnios means decreased fluid and polyhydramnios means increased fluid. What does amniotic fluid do? It cushions the fetus, allows room for the fetus to grow, helps prevent infection, keeps the temperature constant, and helps the fetal lungs to develop. Can you measure a pocket if there is cord or fetal parts in it? The answer is yes, but the measured area of the pocket must be free of cord or fetal parts. What is the normal range for AFI? The answer is 5 to 24 centimeters. What is the normal range for the maximum vertical pocket? The answer is 3 to 8 centimeters. If you diagnose oligohydramnios before 26 weeks, what should you do? The patient should follow up at 26 to 28 weeks. If you diagnose oligohydramnios after 26 weeks, refer to the hospital urgently. If you see polyhydramnios, what should you do? The answer is if polyhydramnios is diagnosed before 26 weeks, follow up in two weeks. If polyhydramnios is diagnosed after 26 weeks, refer to the hospital. Finally, what is a near-field artifact? The answer is a fuzzy or hazy cloud seen in the near field that is not real and comes from scattering of the echoes in the body wall. It may look like placenta or the uterine wall. Thank you for your attention and interest in learning pregnancy ultrasound. Please pause this video now to ask your instructor any questions about this course. We thank the following individuals who played a major role in course development. Dr. Robert Nathan, Dr. William Marks, and Nicole Goldsmith, registered sonographer. Many other individuals contributed valuable time and expertise in the instructional design and materials development, including Dr. Christina Adams Waldorf, Dr. Scott Barnhart, Dr. Michael Kawuya, Susan Kingston, and Stacy Lissett. Finally, we wish to thank Dr. William Marks for the use of images from his book, Ultrasound, A Practical Approach, and Jennifer Summers and Jan Hamanishi for graphic design and illustrations. 
the University of Washington Department of Radiology has trained healthcare workers in pregnancy ultrasound in many parts of the world. If you have questions about this video or course, please contact Dr. Robert Nathan, Dr. William Marks, or Dr. Christina Adams Waldorf. This course was collaboratively developed by the University of Washington Department of Radiology, Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the International Training and Education Center for Health, ITEC. It was made possible through a grant from the GE Foundation. Consano also contributed funding. We are grateful for the video production sponsored by the University of Washington Institute for Simulation and Interprofessional Studies. Please visit our website at tinyurl.com backslash UW ultrasound to access all of our training materials. This material is copyrighted. You are permitted to copy, distribute, and post to websites. You are permitted to modify the content to adapt to specific populations and user needs on the condition that you include attribution to the University of Washington and retain any copyright notices and citations and attributions included in the original basic obstetric ultrasound training for midwives. The material in this video is provided for information purposes only. The University of Washington Institute for Simulation and Interprofessional Studies does not take responsibility for the accuracy of the content in this video.